We made it to Sunday. One second here. Zoom. Got a lock and load here. This phone has a lock and load feature on its camera. Somebody just did keystrokes on my password for sure. That would be like a hacking device of some type. So this morning I just want to do a little reading out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But first, I want to go to the Facebook group and do a little question and answer period. Check the notifications first and see if there's anything important there. I doubt it. It's usually just comments or likes. Yeah, there's nothing in there, which is a good thing. Really good thing to see no trouble on the horizon. At 12.45 a.m. 45 minutes into the day, we're good. All right. I'm going to be reading out of the, uh, the big book. I'll do an Al-Anon, too. I'll do an Al-Anon, and I'll do a... I'll do an Al-Anon online support question or concern, and then I'll read out of the big book. We did the preface last time. Today we'll just move on. So let's see here. And I, I always click love on each post that I comment on just so I know that I commented on it. But sometimes I'll read them over again and I'll be like, I didn't do this one yet. And then I'll look, I say, oh yeah, I did, I love that. Okay, so I did do that yet. Okay. Hmm. I don't want to do anything super specific because I don't want to give away anonymity too, too much. This one's borderline. But it might be helpful, so I think I'm going to do this one. Leaving the name out, I'm going to share the story. Because it does say in the program guidelines that I'm able to share personal stories as long as I'm not using names or specific identifying information. So let's go, let's go with this one. This one's heavy for 12.45 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but why not get the day started with such a beautiful story? And I'll respond to it, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Gosh, it's like when he's sober, I couldn't thank God enough for bringing this amazing man into my life. How on earth did I get so lucky? for my first love to come back into my life. How lucky to have someone that loves me and makes me feel beautiful and sexy every chance he gets. How blessed am I to have someone that would move heaven and earth to make me happy. 
He thought he was hiding it. My body knows before I do. I get sick to my stomach. I sense every movement that's off. A change in his voice. The way his head moves and his eyes aren't completely open. When he can't look me in the fucking eyes. I called it out. He thought he could lie. I couldn't stand to be in the same room. Sober him would have held me and told me it was going to be okay. My heart rate would drop. My head would calm. Drunk him could barely touch me and didn't follow me out of the room or make a fucking noise as I sob on the couch. If I have to live in a hot-ass house and live on ramen, I can do it on my own. I want my love. I want the man of my dreams. I want him to try. He isn't trying, and he's hiding and lying. I need to find a meeting here, and I'm going to tell him I'm going. No sense in telling him anything different. I need help dealing with him drunk, or help to find my strength to stop forcing something that's not going to work, because he's not strong enough. In the back of my mind, in the back of my head, it's still me saying, because I'm not worth the effort, because I can't compete. How damn foolish to leave an unhealthy, abusive relationship and jump into this. How foolish to think love would be enough to make it work. To think that I'm enough, I am enough. I am a fucking savior. Without me, so many people would not have the lives they do. I give every ounce of myself to make sure those around me are okay. I give everything to make sure they are happy because that fulfills me. That brings me joy. I can't save him. He has to do that. You thought me that. You taught me that is what she meant to say. I just don't know if he's ready to save himself. Rambling on and on. This is my journal. You are all my journal. Because feeding this paper is impossible right now. I couldn't hold a pen if my life depended on it. I'm not ready. I know I'm not ready, but fuck. If I'm not holding on by a string, I'm sorry this is long, and if you haven't scrolled, thank you for reading my words and not just passing by. If you did, I scroll. Oh, if you did scroll, I completely understand. Just the rants of a sad woman praying for her to be happy for real, for life to be, to just be okay for once ever. I get moments of happiness at a time before the ceiling caves in on me. Since I was ten, moments and tragedy. Cherished moments forever. Okay. So, that's normal for what I see with Al-Anon members going through these types of situations and witnessing these situations on a daily basis from a bird's eye view. Now, thank God for that. But it wasn't always that way. The lies. When we're so connected to another human being, we can totally notice differences in their demeanor. It's very easy to tell when somebody's lying. They're very uncomfortable. They're 
maybe looking away, like looking to the side, like they can't look you in the eye, they can't. When they're saying something, they just refuse to call it shifty eyes. They're not calm, they're very fidgety and it's not always 100% picking out lies in somebody else. But what I learned today is that I don't have to worry about other people lying to me. If I have facts to back it up and somebody wants to lie to me, that's their problem. And it's not my responsibility to accept that behavior and allow it to continue by keeping that person in my life. You lie to me once today, you're gone. I have that many relationships that are honest relationships. I have no time for liars in my life today. Now there's a big difference between denial and omission. There's lying by omission, there's blatant lying, which is Say, for example, I have brown hair. Andrew, do you have brown hair? No, I have blonde hair. That would be a blatant lie. But, Andrew, what did you do last night, for example? I'll just say what I did last night. I say exactly what I did last night. Like when my spouse comes up to me and says, what did you do last night? Well, I'm going to say, well, this is exactly what I did last night. And I'm not, I'm not going to leave out the part. If I cheated on her, I'm not going to leave out the part that I cheated on her and say, oh yeah, I fixed the toaster. And I was working on the floors and I brushed my teeth and I went to bed. I'm not, and then I'm now lying about the big part. I can leave out, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me leaving out the brushing the teeth part. She's not gonna capture me lying by omission, by omission for forgetting to let her know that I took a piss. But to actually leave out something relationship changing that's lying by omission. Now, alcoholics are good for lying by omission, but they're also good for blatant lying. I have been on both sides of the coin. I'm an alcoholic, recovered, and, an, and a recovered codependent. So these things I know from my personal experience of how to be treated by an addict or an alcoholic, but like I work with addicts mostly, and alcohol is a drug. I also work the other side of the coin where I am the addict um, and I'm dealing with codependence. I've been on both sides of the coin. So yeah, lying is a huge thing, especially in late stage addiction. It's a big thing. That's all I knew at the end of my addiction. So that being said, when lies occur, there's not really much else to do. I mean, the relationship's pretty damaged at that point. So it's only going to get worse. I mean, addiction is a progressive and deadly disease that ends up in jails, institutions, and death. I mean, if it's bad now, it only gets worse if they don't get help and stay on top of their game. Like, they got to keep getting the treatment. Which, and then in the codependent, feeling that incessant need to be with somebody, to be in a relationship with a member of the opposite sex. When my fiancé left me over four years ago, I didn't get into another relationship for, like, four years. Like, she da she pretty damn well left me, I would say, near five years ago. And it was about f just over four years that I got into a, a new relationship. So I wouldn't be getting into new relationships even... Jeez. Uh, it's tough. Like, relationship is tough because, I mean, we can never pick out the time that we're going to meet the person that we feel connected to. 
that we have chemistry with. But I can rest assured that if somebody has a, an, a substance abuse problem, a mental health issue that's going untreated, or a codependency issue that's not being fixed in some type of way, it's probably not going to be a healthy relationship. In fact, it's not. I mean, alcoholics, severely, an alcoholics, addicts, mental health issues, all these things, they, they don't end well when they're not being treated. So they're very sick people, uh, and they, I wouldn't be around them. I wouldn't even bother asking them to go get help. I just, if they talk about it, I would talk about it with them. If they didn't talk about it, I would, I would be going, I would be running the other way so damn quick. My heart wouldn't stop till I got out of sight of that person based off my experience with these types of relationships. Because they end up exactly like, this is just a typical codependent falling in love with a, somebody that needs to be taken care of. And, you know, it's, oh, I'm going to take care of this person. I, I, I can see it now. I'm going to take care of this person. I'm going to change them. I'm going to fix them. I'm going to change all their nasty ways. I'm going to be the one to do it just by loving them more. And it's a real firm belief. Like, it's a solid belief. Like, it's just so ingrained in my mind that I'm going to change this other person. They will stop drinking because they will see how much I love them. They will stop drugging because they will see how much I love them. And that is not what's going to happen. Because it doesn't. If you're an addict like me, the only thing that can stop me from my active addiction is having a spiritual experience in my experience. And that doesn't come from another human being. That comes from a power greater than myself. So when I'm a codependent trying to fix another alcoholic, an addict, I'm just going to say addict for the rest of this video because it's the same thing. Addict covers every addiction. I'm not going to play God well because A, I'm a poor manager of my own life already. Being uh, being a codependent that's not recovered. I'm doing things to please others. I'm enabling their sick behaviors. I'm buying them booze. I'm drinking with them. I'm giving them money. I'm giving them shelter. I'm calling in to work sick for them. I'm lying to family members and friends about their drinking or their drugging just to kind of make th cover things up. I'm covering up for them. I'm lying for them. Like... I'm just, I'm basically like, I'm caretaking for this other human being. I'm gonna make this work, damn it. I'm determined. Typical traits of every codependent. It's, no one, nobody's unique here. And, and then all this stuff starts to just kind of fall by the wayside. It starts to get tiring after a while. I start to lose my energy as the codependent, trying to fix this other person, trying to take care of this other person. And they just throw it right back in my face with yet another spree of drugging and I'm left feeling betrayed because I'm wondering, does this person not see all the things, all the love that I'm giving them? Are they just totally blind to the fact that I'm helping them and they're just going back to their addiction? Like they're going to choose that over me? Yeah, they are. They really are. Until they're ready to get help, there's nothing I can do for them other than stop enabling their sick behaviors. I have to stop caretaking for that person. And I'm going to get pissed off the more I struggle for control of that human being. And the less control I have as a result of, and, and as a result of struggling for that control. But the only way I can know that is to actually go through that experience and realize that it does not work. I can't save him. She said it right here. I can't save him. No. No, but we will try. As codependents, we'll try our damnedest. We'll, we'll, we'll pull all the punches. Use every trick in the book that we've been taught. Some of it might even work for a short period of time, but usually in the end it hits us right where it hurts. Right in the gut. 
So, and it says here, she, she's got some things wrong here, though. I just don't know if he's ready to save himself. Well, the thing is, I couldn't save myself. I was powerless. I was hopeless. I had no chance. I had to ask for help. And I think that's what she might mean here. He's, he's got to be ready to ask for help before any... And then she might be of service to him. Once he's ready for the treatment. However, I don't see that happen very often. I see it happen sometimes. Where the spouse or the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the husband is actually helpful in the other person's recovery. Because usually they just get in the way, honestly. In my experience, from what I see. They have to be totally supportive of that person's recovery. And I'll just use me for an example. Let's say I have a, an addict girlfriend. I have to be willing to take treatment for my codependency so that I don't get in the way of her recovery. It says it right in the book. And that's the typical trait of a codependent not in recovery. I'm going to I'm going to create a plan for my spouse on how they can recover so I will feel better. I'm going to live their life for them. I'm going to change their behaviors. I'm going to tell them what to do and what not to do. Typical trait of every codependent. I'm not responsible. They're to blame. I'm going to point the finger at somebody because I can't be at fault. I'm just the victim. I'm the one being treated like crap. I'm the, I'm the abuse victim here. So one question I have for every codependent that stays in a toxic relationship, gets out of it and continues to go back to that toxic relationship, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So how come you keep going back to that same situation? And this is the answer I get. Well, I just, uh, I seen some positive changes there for a couple weeks. And I just, you know, I thought it would be better this time. I thought it would be better. I thought, it, I thought that I seen enough change to warrant me going back to that relationship. Yeah. Fair enough. So why did you go back six times? Well... <laughs> Because I've seen the same thing six times, and I just figured, you know, that, that was enough to get me back, to get me ho hooked back six times. Now this is common. We'll go back to our abuser. Because we don't know enough about addiction, and on top of that, we don't know enough about codependency to be able to handle those situations appropriately before learning about them. I, I tell every codependent this, and I'm so grateful I was able to go through this. I was the addict. I was also a codependent with an addict codependent for four years. It took me abusing my son, our son, for her to finally... I cheated on her. I ignored her. I lied to her. I stole from her. I stole her time. I stole her money. I stole her friends. I stole her best friends. Like, I stole everything about her life. And she, and it wasn't, none of that would cause her to leave me, but for me abusing my son. And that, right there in and of itself, just goes to show what a codependent that doesn't know that the addict will continue to use that person as a source of income, as a source of warmth. They're providing for me. I have an example. A wild animal, a raccoon for instance, one of the most famous scavengers ever. You put food outside anywhere within the vicinity of a raccoon, I guarantee you by the morning, that food will all be gone. And you can do this for as long as you want before getting the point that that raccoon is going to snatch that food every single day until you stop feeding it. 
but meet that raccoon in real life, no matter how long you've been feeding it for, and that thing's going to tear your face off because they're volatile, which means they are easily frightened and even more so easily pissed off. They can be vicious. Same thing for an addict. You keep giving me money and time. You keep buying me time by giving me money and a place to live and free food and you're taking care of my kid. I am not going to... And you're giving me sex. That is probably the keeper. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to abuse you. I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to hate on you. And then I'm going to say sorry. And I'm going to manipulate you with my words over and over again. And I'm going to convince you every single time with my words. And I'll even match my actions up with my words. Just long enough so I can rope you back in. And then I'll be back at it again. Even worse than before. Because as I clean up, I'm not doing it for me. I'm only doing it to get you off my back. Most codependents don't know that until they actually go through it themselves. I was the same way. Went through this for years. And I work with codependents on a daily basis. I see it every day. It's not... It's difficult to, to watch. It's difficult to experience these things. The pain of a codependent relationship is... Second to none. Especially when lying, cheating, and stealing is involved. And the fortunate part is there is help. But the most difficult thing in getting and helping codependents is I want to focus on everybody else but me. Because that's what I know. If I make you happy, I'll be happy. If I just loved you a little more. If I just provided a little more. If I just spent a little more time on you. You would feel better and I would feel better as a result of you feeling better. And that's not how life works. How life works is, I don't worry at all about you and how you want to treat your disease. I'll let you know what you can do, but at the same time, this is what I'm doing. I'm getting treatment for my codependency. I'm learning how to say no. I'm learning how to set limits. I'm learning how to set boundaries. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to enforce them. I'm going to create a support network, a team of people, so that when you confront me with your aggressive, bombastic behavior, I have a defense mechanism lined up to deal with that crap. Because a codependent is famous for saying, I can do this on my own. I can handle this relationship and make all these wise decisions. No, I can't. I learned that the hard way. By falling flat on my butt. Time and time again. It happens. Life's not fair. There's tons of sadness in these types of relationships. I have empathy. I just become more desensitized to it when I work on this stuff every day. But it doesn't change reading stories like this and having a tremendous amount of empathy for this woman. For what she's going through. And I've never even met her before. I can just imagine actually being in the situation. You know, so, what I did, this is all I did to get out of a situation. I had to be willing to take direction and create a healthy detachment option to get out of my codependency, my people pleasing behaviors, being a yes man. If you don't like me, well, my life's just over. I can't function properly. I need everybody to like me. I need everybody to love me. 
And if they don't, I'm going to do whatever it takes. There's 7 billion people on this planet. And that's not very many, but damn it, I can make them all love me and like me. All I got to do is be more giving. Be more self-sacrificing. I got to be nicer. Keep it simple. And it's all bullshit. But the funny part is I'll actually believe those things. So I had to be willing to listen and take direction, like I said. By someone who's been through this, I had to trust the process of healing. And even though it's not what I wanted to do, and there is still, I don't really get what I want most of the time, but I just pray for what I need and I always get what I need. The answers. When I open up my ears for long enough to listen for the answer, and I trust that that is the answer that I need to go with, that's what I do. Now, if I was this woman in this situation with this man, I wouldn't even be talking about it. I would be living in a hot-ass house and living on ramen. I would rather be dead in a ditch than living with this freaking drunk if I was this woman. I've quit jobs for less than this man is doing to this woman. So I don't understand why she stays. I do and I don't. Like, I would not be feeling beautiful and sexy by this man when he's going off the handle, drinking, lying to me, cheating on me and stealing from me, falling down drunk in the house, and totally ignoring me when I'm sharing my feelings with him. I would not be saying he's making me feel beautiful and sexy every chance he gets. Now, maybe she's just being sarcastic here, and I could totally see the anger in this post with all the F-bombs. But damn, like, I really hope she's not being serious when she says that he makes her feel beautiful and sexy every chance he gets. Unless she, unless the reality of that is never, because that, in my opinion, would be never, just by reading this initial post. She's constantly sad, depressed, bawling her eyes out. She's second guessing herself. She thinks she's a she thinks she's a she thinks she's a savior. This is all just normal codependency stuff. I I'm so giving, I'm so giving, I'm so giving. And then all of a sudden I notice that that giving is not working because I'm not getting anything in return for it. So I need to be getting a return for my giving. Or else I'm going to eventually start to resent that. Because I'm giving with expectations if I'm this woman. I'm giving and expecting this person to love me back. To stop engaging in those drunk behaviors. To stop getting drunk. To get some help for their disease. Now again, let's take all the focus off me. You know, because I'm not the problem. It's everything external. Not true. Not true one bit. I learned that I was the one placing myself in a position over and over again to feel hurt. All I have to do is look at the history. What has happened before with this type of situation? So, I can expect... Probably the same thing is going to happen again. Because it's already happened numerous times before. As codependents, we tend to seek sick people. Because we love caring for people. We love helping people. We love reaching out and rescuing. We're like, we see that sick puppy dog and we like feel so sad and we want to help the puppy dog. But that's just normal caretaker behavior. It all starts from early childhood teachings and it carries on to teenager teachings like most codependents grow up to be leaders of the house by like age 10 or 11 because dad's never there and mom's not really emotionally available either so it just like for me it just taught me to just grow up quick and 
No, I didn't know how to handle that type of responsibility at that age. I didn't know how to act as a 25-year-old at 10 years old, so you can shoot me for not knowing. But uh, anyways, I've learned to love properly in al -Anon. We learn to be appreciative of what we have and stop wanting so much what we don't have. So part of learning to love is I got to first learn to love me. I got to be a friend to me before I can be a friend to anybody else. I got to be able to see the truth. And for this woman here, the truth is that she should probably go get some help for her own stuff and stop worrying so much about this man. Because he shows no inclination to change. And even if he does, I still suggest she goes to get help on a daily basis for her disease, which is people-pleasing, enabling, codependency. It's all the same. It's real simple. There's no right or wrong way for her to live her life, but if it's me, I want to feel happy, I want to feel serenity, and I want to feel freedom. And being tied down by a drunken fool is not my cup of tea. It used to be. I used to be okay with that stuff. I used to live with drug dealers. I used to hang out with criminals. I used to be a criminal. I used to love that life. I used to be enthralled by that life. That's what I craved, is to be around the lower class, like, high risk citizens, because I thought it was exciting. And today, that lifestyle to me is too risky and it's boring. Those people always end up miserable or dead, or both, <laughs> in my experience. So, I don't want that. What I want, I want love. And, you know, I do want that today. You know, I'm not going to find that at the bars. I ain't going to find that at the drug dealers. I ain't going to find that out on the streets. The only place I ever found that was in the rooms of the 12 Steps and the 12 Traditions. Yeah, I may get bits and pieces of it here and there in other places, but the brunt of it comes from Al-Anon and other programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. That's where the heavy-hitting love comes from. So I just keep on with that. and you know, Prayers with this woman tonight. Prayers for everybody going through a similar situation like this tonight. You... We'll just see me write a quick comment here. Blessings. I'll just write bless, you know. That's all, that's all I need to write. And hopefully this woman can find some solace in, a, in an Al-Anon room or an ACA room one of these days because, geez, I've been there done that I have the I have the metal to go along with it and you couldn't imagine ever getting into a relationship like that ever again Jeez. and the abuse just gets worse too that's the problem but we go back we go back until the pain is great enough to change and then we will change but at least I get to stay sober tonight reading that story and talking about my own experience. Yeah. That's it. I did the preface last time there. I was given this big book here by a, a man at the Talbot House when I was there. He signed the front of it here for me. And uh, I won't name his name on camera here, but that man taught me quite a few things while I was living at that men's recovery home nearly three years ago. And he, he quoted here, read on, brother. That's the first time I read that in years. I, I didn't even know that was there until now. Forward to the first edition. So we're getting into the boring stuff here in the big book. This is the foreword as it appeared in the first printing of the first edition. 
1939. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely how we rec have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we are all sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. It is important that we remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. Being mostly business or professional folk, we could not well carry on our occupations in such an event. We would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an advocation. I'm just going to look up advocation because that sentence is very important. hobby or minor occupation. So we're not doing this for money. We're not doing this for fame. We're not doing this for fortune. We're not doing this for property. We're just doing this because we think it's fun, honestly. Like the real like I I would say like the the majority of people that I see heavy into the program will say that it's they're just doing it just for fun it's serious but it's, you know, it's it's nothing more than just something to do not for any personal gain or any sort of acknowledgement or thank you or any of that it's just it's just doing the next right thing so that alleviates much of the suspicion regarding well why are you doing this type of work like what makes you want to help me? Well, because we were once in that precarious position of sickness and we found that the best way to work through that and stay sober is two alcoholics working with each other in order to stay sober. And this stemmed from two to three to four and now millions of people do it. We all stay sober. So, that's enough for us to continue with the work. And all those other things, just as a byproduct of us staying sober, wonderful things happen. Sometimes we get fortune. Sometimes we get fame. Sometimes we get properties and... All kinds of good things happen to alcoholics that stay sober, addicts that stay sober, codependents that stop enabling. We get healthy relationships. That's probably my biggest gift. I have healthy relationships now. Doesn't seem like much of a gift to people that don't understand healthy relationships, but it tells you. It makes life a whole lot less stressful. No stress, really. I mean, it has its challenges and ups and downs, but it's not weeks, months, and years of misery like it used to be. It's like, you don't like what I say today? I don't too much give a damn what you think of me. And that's what keeps me calm. When writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to omit his personal name, designating himself instead as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very earnestly, we ask the press also to observe this request, 
for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no dues or fees. There are no fees or dues whatever, whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. Now see, that was the first edition. That's the third tradition right there. Honest desire. We changed that word. We took that word honest out because we learned over the years that most alcoholics that enter the rooms do not have an honest desire to stop drinking, but they do have some type of inclination to stop drinking. I mean, anybody that doesn't have some sort of inclination to stop drinking is not really going to to become a member of AA and we won't accept them you know you can come to AA drunk you can come to AA stoned off your trees all you want but in the end the only thing that that's doing is blocking me from the actual help that the program has to offer which is 12 steps and 12 traditions and nowhere in those 12 steps and 12 traditions will it say to recreationally go out and abuse drugs or alcohol. So, I mean, you want come to come to any meetings you want, drunk and high, just don't be disturbing the meeting and we'll have you there. But without at least the desire to stop, to want to stop drinking, then you, you know, you can't be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But once you get that desire, you can become a member. The second you say you're a member, you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are not allied with any sect, any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. We shall be interested to hear from those who are getting results from this book. Particularly those who have commenced work with other alcoholics. We should like to be helpful in such cases. Inquiry by scientific, medical, and religious societies will be welcomed. Well, I'll just give a brief history here. I drank for 14 years. I couldn't stop drinking. I obsessed. I used it to numb the pain, to forget, blackout drunks, social lubricant, all kinds of things alcohol did for me. So I was definitely an alcoholic, and I definitely am an alcoholic. But, you know, that stopped working for me, and, you know, I started coming to AA, and I stuck around the rooms for quite a while. I got a sponsor. I started working the steps. I went to some meetings, and I kept going to meetings. I kept calling my sponsor, and I kept working my steps. And I still do all those things on a daily basis. I, I don't call my sponsor every day anymore, but I mean, I have enough time in the program now that I don't need to be calling my sponsor every day. I say for the first year, I should call my sponsor once a day, at least. Even if I'm having a good day, just to kind of build the, make the, the habit of reaching out to call that number. You know, I, I started calling my sponsor every day later on into my recovery because I finally realized the value of calling my sponsor. I use my sponsor like I would use a drink today, like I would use a drug. I'll call my sponsor whenever I want to get high. Like whenever I would normally be experiencing a feeling, that would be enough for me to get high in the past or enable somebody's sick behaviors. So, that being said, I found that Alcoholics Anonymous wasn't enough, and it tells me that in Alcoholics Anonymous, if I'm looking to get help for my outside issues, it says to go do that, if, if just Alcoholics Anonymous isn't enough for me. So I needed to branch my, I needed to hedge my bets, and I needed to, um, I needed to divvy up my assets, so to speak. <coughs> so what I did, was I, 
I stopped sneezing, and then I went to Narcotics Anonymous and ACA, which is the same thing as Al-Anon, just a different program. And I went to Overcomers Anonymous, and I watched some Sex Anonymous speakers on YouTube, and I got involved in some Facebook groups, recovery related for drugs, alcohol, and um, codependency. And I went to Gamblers Anonymous for a short period of time before realizing that I was getting enough recovery in all the other programs to cause me to not even consider placing a bet in my daily life today. But I'm definitely willing to branch that part of my life back out again. And I still do, I do speaks actually, and uh, some of them involve talking about my gambling past, which I will put on my Gamblers Anonymous playlists on my YouTube videos. So, you know, I, I, I sought psychiatry, I sought religion, those didn't work for me, but I, I at least tried them. Doctors, like family doctors, I tried psychologists, detoxes treatment centers you know that that was okay but it wasn't enough to you know get me through my entire recovery um, changed my people places and things I replaced all those people places and things with new people places and things and those new people places and things are what helped me stay clean today they're what helped me create healthy relationships and strengthen my healthy relationships today I seeked counseling that helped for quite a period of time, but I don't, I don't, you know, I do the counseling today. I don't, I don't seek counseling anymore. I do seek counsel whenever I have a problem that I can't deal with on my own. And that's usually via my sponsor or somebody that has a man that has more time in the program than I do. You know, I work with newcomers. I fill my days with healthy activities today. I don't put too much on my plate in one day I keep it simple and I meditate when I need to and I just work these steps I I don't want to get too much in the steps but I, I I did them all in order one two three four and just continued on like that with my sponsor I just did the ABC recovery and I got ABC results just like it said it would in the book all the promises came true. In this book here, there's there's promises on um, page 84, 83 of the big book. You know, they all come true. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. Painstaking means willing to go to any lengths. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. That gut instinct. We'll start to trust that rather than our stupid mind that tells us to do the complete opposite of what is what we should do most of the time. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. You know, they said we, us, so many times in those promises. That's the key to true recovery. Getting out of the poor me's, the eyes, the me's, it's all about me. It's a me, 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 me. It's all about me. I can't. I won't. I don't. 
do that turns into I can, I will, and I do. And then we can. You know? We end up working together. We do. We, we do. We. Not I. Not you. We. Real simple. Passion is about my life today. That's another gift I've been given. That depression is all gone today. Just pure life. Crazy. But it's fun. It's enjoyment. Just looking back on everything now and I used to be so resistant to this process, but today it's just a part of my life. It's like flicking on and off a light switch. You know, that's just, you know, I wake up and flick on the switch and I'm off to the races for the day. And then I just turn that switch off when I'm ready to go to bed and I wake up and I do it all again, the same thing as I, you know, just do whatever I can the next day. I just keep it all in one day today. If I can just stay clean today, I don't have to worry about tomorrow because I'm staying clean today. Just like in my addiction, I was always just looking for drugs to get me through that day. As long as I had enough to get me through that day, I was good. And I do the same thing in recovery. As long as I have enough to get me through today, then I'll worry about tomorrow when tomorrow gets here, which again, it'll be today. So that's another thing I got taught. I had to learn to live in today. I was always so focused on what I had done in the past and what was coming down in the future and I was so not in the moment. And I tell you, living in the moment, if you haven't experienced living in the moment every day, it's quite a thing. That's another gift, being able to live in the present, to be right in here and now. Being appreciative of the sounds, the birds, the wind, the rain, the fire, the water, the waves. Silence. Being able to handle silence today. Being in, enjoying silence, actually, like being okay with my own company, being okay with being alone, not feeling lonely, solitude. Waking up every day and feeling like I have a sense of purpose, something I can give, something tangible I can do for this world, even if it's just a little bit. All thanks to the 12 steps and 12 traditions. I get this all the time from newcomers. What do I do about this situation? What would you do? Well, I would, I would probably work the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. Well, there's got to be another way. Like you got to, there's got to be another answer. Well, I mean, if you if you feel that way, there's the door. You know, go do some more research, and and then come back to me and let me know. Because I want to know. Because I haven't found a better way. If you can find a better way, please come back and let me know. And I, I can be honest with you in saying this, that there's not been one person come back and tell me that they found a better way than the 12 steps and 12 traditions yet to deal with addiction or codependency. But they keep trying. <laughs> That's the best. They keep trying. <laughs> Addicts are funny like that. <laughs> They'll bang their head off a wall <laughs> so many times before finally giving up the fight. But I can identify, I used to do the same thing. So we just gotta let them go and have that experience. The freedom to experience the pain. That was the catalyst and change for me, so that's probably how it is for everybody. So, Anyways, with that, I'm sure we all had a good laugh there at the end. Every, every Pretty much every addict and codependent can identify with that last part, so. 
with that, I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday and whatever you do today. Make sure it's the right thing. Make sure it's the healthy thing. That's just a suggestion. Peace.